This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much. That's a lot of scripture. Um, if you stuck with that, we're going to cover that this morning. But before we do, uh, I as well just want to welcome you. It is good to be with you this morning in worship. As Charlie mentioned, we are in a series going through the book of First Thessalonians. And, and as a new church plant that has recently moved into this location but have not existed that long in general, uh, we long to reflect much of what we see in this letter. Much of what we just read there, that as we preached last week, that these group of people, that the word of God was received by them and it was at work in them. And we long to be a community that begins to match some of these things that Paul speaks and, and says of them. And before we kind of dive into this next section this morning, I want to ask you first, have you ever been a part of a very awkward encounter with somebody else's family? Have you ever been at a meal or at someone's home or around just, you know, it could be a friend's parents or the whole family, and you realize that you are now a part of an interaction that you did not sign up for? And it gets a little bit awkward and a little bit tense, and you don't know what is going to happen next. I, I can remember in college that when I started dating Claire, I got connected to a mentor of hers, um, this woman named Lisa, who was in her sorority in college and was older, had lived there, was working at a church close by. And when I started dating Claire, I realized I kind of started dating that family. And they were kind of uh, the ones that had to approve of me being in her life. And I remember early on this moment we had. They had three children. The youngest at the time was probably like six. And they had some behavioral issues with her, um, like just real issues that they've later found out and diagnosed some other things. But she was joyful and, and loving and kind. And there would just be these moments, though, where she was really with it and witty, and she would say some things that would kind of cross the line. We're sitting at dinner one time, and this happens, that she's clearly disobeyed enough to where it's like, okay, this is getting a little awkward. And the mom jumps up, Lisa, and grabs her and says, okay, I'm going to spank you. And we're sitting there, and we're like, how is this going to go? How is this going to go? She scans the room, and she looks at her mom, and she goes, I want daddy to spank me. <laughs> and it was this moment where I was like, I don't know if she knows what she just said, but she meant to say that in a way that this was going to break the ice in the room. And we sat there, and we were like, I don't know if I'm supposed to laugh or if I'm supposed to get up and walk and leave the room. And in that moment, you know, they, they also kind of looked at each other as parents, and they began to kind of smile and laugh a little bit, but had to go right back into parenting mode pretty quickly. And, and what began to happen that evening, but then really just continually over time, is that when a moment arose that was either awkward or funny or, you know, disciplinary type stuff, that they didn't pull away. They didn't go and say, hey, excuse us, could y'all go in the other room or we're going to go into the other room. But they actually just began to show us what life looks like in their family. They, they kind of just included us in and let us have a view of the good, the bad, the ugly, the everything in between. And what it did for Claire and I is it just really shaped the way that we viewed family life and marriage, and it was really, really formative for us. And I tell you that story this morning because in many ways, if you followed the verses this morning, that what Paul says in this over a chapter of Scripture, he really could have said it in like four lines. Hey, I wanted to come see you. I couldn't. I started to get worried, so I sent Timothy. He went, gave me, gave me a report as he came back, and all is good. Praise God. That's kind of it. It could have just been walked through and move on to the next stuff, right? We're about to get into the end of the chapter, which is real kind of the, the, pra the practicalness of what you're supposed to do. But for some reason, there's a lot of text there. And what I think Paul is doing and what I think God is inspiring the scriptures is he actually wanted to give us this kind of inner working, this inner view of a family. He wanted us to see the ins and outs of their relationships with one another and to begin to understand what it is to be that sort of community and family that makes a real difference. Because don't forget, as we introed into this, that Paul says in the beginning of the first chapter of Thessalonians, he says that this church became an example to all the believers in Macedonia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. That this was a church that didn't just say it, say the gospel and say they believe it, but they showed it. They didn't even need to be told about this church because people began to hear about them in the way that they lived. 
And so this morning, what I want to actually do is I, I think that we get this snapshot picture of what it looks like to be a healthy church, a healthy community. And the reality is, is if we're going to do that, that involves you and me. It involves all of us that what we do here on Sunday morning is just one part of what it means to be a part of a church. That in many ways we gather to worship and to be, to sing and give God due thanks. But in many ways it's as we leave here that we begin to live into all that God has for his people. And so you're a part of this. And so I want to pray this morning. We're going to go through five health, like signs of a healthy church, of a health, healthy church community. And what I would hope is that you're maybe drawn to one of these. That you're moved maybe towards a step of action this morning. And then again, like we said, that the word of God would be received by you and at work in you. And so let's pray this morning, and then we're going to get into these five points. Father, thank you for this opportunity uh, to open your word, which we believe is active and alive and living and more real than anything else we'll come to contact with. And so, Lord, would you help us to receive what you have for us this morning as a new community who longs to reflect you in this neighborhood and in this city. Speak to us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so first, first point here, if you just tracked with it, the, the end of chapter 2, Paul really uses some interesting language. And what we see first is that they were emotionally connected. I don't know if you saw, I have the verses up here just so you can look at it, but in 17, Paul says, we were torn away from you. That Paul was with them, and then he suddenly had to get rushed out of the city due to this persecution. And, and that word torn there is actually a really important word. It means in the Greek, orphaned. That we were orphaned from you. We were literally ripped away like a mother from her child. And as he continues to talk about it, he's using very emotive language. That we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face. One other point that's really interesting about the language here is that that word desire that is translated this way in this text that in almost every other place it's translated in the, in the New Testament, it's actually the same word for lust. It's used negatively. This is the one context that it's used positively. That he had this desire, this yearning, this urging, that he loved these people. He was very, very intimately connected to them. There was a strong bond. And I just wonder in general, have, have you experienced life in that sort of community before? Where, where the love and the connection between the people in that group is so strong that it could be used of this sort of language. I, I think, you know, we moved here right before the church really got going and get, got planted just in the planning, the phases, and I learned quickly of something called Bonton Farms in South Dallas. Especially as they were moving and uh, at the early stages were going to be a part of developing what they did down there here in the Lake Highlands area. And I remember the, the, the guy that really started this, Darren Babcock, some of you know him, and I was so moved by the way he talked about what they did and, and took language from farming and plants and soil and, and connected it to people. And he said, you know, in, in planting, in farming, you can take two seeds from the same bag and you can put them in the ground and one will grow up and produce fruit and, and be healthy and it's a beautiful plant. And the same seed from the same bag can actually be planted and can wither and die and it does not produce same plant, same bag. But he says, depending on how it was cared for and the nutrients available to it, it affects the growth of that plant. And he said, I, I became an urban missionary in South Dallas because these people, much like these plants, they were not given the same sort of nutrients and resources to grow up into who God had made them to be. And it moved him so much that he moved in amongst the people. He became a missionary. And it's beautiful to see what's come of it, but it has taken labor and work and love and this emotional connection that is very costly. And, you know, for us as a church, uh, the way that we are trying to live into this, and again, it's messy at times, it's not always exactly how you draw it up, but the way that we're trying to live into this is by living with each other in community outside of these gatherings. That as we gather in homes to begin to share our lives and get to know one another, this is where this emotional connection and connectivity and care for somebody begins to develop. And, and I'll just say this. This is actually be a great week for anybody that's been interested or wondered or maybe you've been elbowed by your spouse to think about it. This would be a really good week just to, to join and jump in. We're having a meal night. It's no schedule, just having a meal. We've got groups across this neighborhood and the city, and we'd love to invite you into that because in many ways we will never live into what this church did 
if we don't become connected to one another in this sort of way. But as we move on, Paul wasn't just connected to them emotionally because he was this really feely guy. But he, be, he, he developed this care and longing for them that was spiritual. And this is the second point is that he was spiritually invested and they were spiritually invested. I don't know if you caught this language. This is actually just mind-blowing. But he says, you know, I wanted to see you. I couldn't. In verse 19, for what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and our joy. And in verse 8 further, he says, for we live if you are standing in the Lord Jesus. That what Paul is saying there is that what I most prize and value in life is not the accumulation of things. It's not the achievement that I can get. It's not all these other things that so often life becomes about for us. He says, what matters most for me is that when Jesus returns, what I want to see is the sea of people that I have invested and sowed into with me standing before Jesus. That this guy was driven by that reality. You know, this is, again, the first place that this word parousia comes up in the New Testament, which just means we speak of it as Jesus' second coming, that he is coming again. Paul was so driven by that reality. And, and I was thinking, you know, a year ago, about this time, I don't know if you can remember, it's going to be almost 70 degrees today, but about a year ago this time is when we experienced that snow and freeze for I don't even remember how many days it was, but it was wild. We had just moved from Boston not that long before then, and I felt like I was literally right back in Boston. It was like chaos. We were in an apartment complex at the time, and I mean, it really did feel kind of like the apocalypse. Power was out, and things were bursted, and water was everywhere. I mean, it was just like crazy. But I just wonder, and I'm looking at Charlie, and I'm like, their, pipe, their pipes burst, so he's like, I probably don't want to think back to that time. But some of you experienced some of those challenges of, you know, that weather. And, and I just wonder, though, if you knew that that was to come in the way that it was, would you have done a few things differently, maybe? Charlie's probably like, I don't think I could have done much for the pipes. But, but if you knew what was coming, in many ways, it would affect how you would prepare for that thing, right? I mean, in the same way, if, if you're into investing in stocks, and there's a term for this if you do know some information before you're supposed to know it. But if you were to know what things were going to happen in the stock market before it happened, you'd probably do some things differently with your money and how you invested, right? Paul lived in this reality that he knew what was coming. He knew Jesus was going to come again because he knew Jesus had come the first time and did what he did and died and resurrected, that he lived in it. That was his world. And we have a challenge, you know, we don't walk around like Paul knowing people that physically saw Jesus' death and resurrection. But God says we do have something more powerful than that, his very spirit within us. And I think all of us kind of have heard things like this before, like I know I'm supposed to think more about his coming in eternity, but we just kind of continue to move on. And, and again, I remember this sermon I listened to in, in one of my preaching classes in seminary, and it was kind of this gripping illustration that it was a little bit excessive, but, you know, this pastor is talking about, hey, one day this dad who had kids, family, everything, he put the kids down, he went upstairs, he was the architect, he went into his second floor loft and started to get into his work, and he did a lot better job than I'm doing right now, but I'm giving you the cliff notes. And this person walks up the stairs, and standing in the door is this guy kind of dressed in a Grim Reaper outfit, and he's like, excuse me, what are you doing here? He's like, it's your time. And the guy at the desk is like, what do you mean it's my time? And he said, well, it's your time. It's time to go. And he said, whoa, I, I'm not done here. I've got a lot of plans. I've got all these things that I've got yet to do. And he said, I'm sorry that the time has come. And again, I remember listening to that sermon, and, and, and the point there is that so often it takes something tragic or, or difficult to happen in our life that we begin to have this perspective on our present life that we might want to change a few things. Paul was so driven he so lived in that reality of who Jesus was and what really mattered in life that it affected how he invested in the people. It's the most important thing really in our life. We all know it, that whether you've sat with somebody on their deathbed or you know somebody going through that or you've experienced kind of a, a life-altering uh, accident in your life, that what comes to mind is not your possessions or all these other things that we care so much about in the moment, but what matters is people. And Paul says, what mattered most? If you want to care for people, then you want to invest in them, to be a disciple. 
And again, as we, as we think about being a healthy church, a healthy community, that a healthy church is one where the people in it own the mission themselves. That I am a disciple of Jesus who makes disciples of Jesus. And again, that disciple word can be real like heavy. You can feel like, I don't know the first thing about being a disciple. But what it really means is that you want to invest your life. And as you walk with Jesus, you want to help somebody else walk with Jesus. And, and I think about my sister-in-law who in college, you know, devoted her time to a young life group of girls, freshman year on. And, and I couldn't help but think about her with this, this moment because for her, she gave up and sacrificed much to do that. And she was all the way in all of these years in college. And as I read this text, what I imagine is that when Jesus returns, she's going to stand before Jesus and she's going to see a group of women that she poured into. That like Paul, as, as we invest, we have a much richer life now, but we are sowing into something that is so valuable. And I just wonder, as a church, are there some ways that you might be able to do that like Paul? I've got to keep moving because i got five points, and that's probably good for all of you. But the, the next one, as you see, is, you know, he, he's speaking of his emotion, his, his spiritual investment. It clearly is all connected. But if you saw the first few verses of chapter 3, he says, When I could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone, and we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ, to establish and exhort you in your faith, that no one be moved by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we are destined for this. For when we were with you, we kept telling you before him that we were to suffer affliction just as it has come to pass and just as you know. And hear this. He says, for this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow your, the tempter had tempted you and our labor would have been in vain. What Paul says there is that as we were separated and as I'm not able to make my way back, I, I begin to worry like a parent being kept up at night, you know, their kid hasn't come back for curfew or he hadn't called like he's supposed to, that he's kept up anxiously wondering that these young believers that grabbed hold of the gospel, but now as he's been separated, he wonders if they're still holding on in the midst of present affliction. And, you know, he uses this language that I sent Timothy to strengthen and exhort you and encourage you so that you wouldn't be moved by the affliction. That... That I wanted to make sure you had solid legs to be able to withstand what was coming your way. And again, I had this image in my mind, you know, we have a six-month-old and now just over two-year-old boy. And as I hold up Crew, our youngest, you know, I'm trying to see how he puts his weight down on the floor. And I, I hold him up and just see if he can kind of hold it for a minute. And he can't at all. They're just wobbly and he just falls. I catch him. <laughs> but Crew, I mean, Knox, oh gosh, I'm already doing that. Knox, our oldest, he can stand up solid on his own. But I, I kid you not, if you've been around him at all, the kid falls down every 10 seconds. It, it's like he just doesn't know. He doesn't know how gravity works. He doesn't know how to pick his feet up. He's kind of heavy set in the stomach. There might be a few different reasons behind it. But they are different when you look at them and just hold them up and see the way that their weight stands. But in many ways, they, they both fall over pretty easily and, and pretty quickly. And, and what Paul is saying is that in the faith, especially for these group of people, they were young in the faith that he knew their legs were not strong, that when affliction was going to come and suffering was going to come, that they were going to fall, and he was afraid. And, and, and the two points that I just want to mention is, you know, I think we all can understand why he was afraid. All of us have experienced some form or fashion of hardship or suffering or affliction. And that it's in those moments that push comes to shove and you figure out what you really believe or what really matters, or if you think God can actually hold the weight that he says he can. And what I think is actually wonderful about this is that if we're going to stand steady in affliction, which is the third point, to stand steady in affliction, that there's two things that Paul does here. That one, he says, I don't know if you caught it, he said, we prepared you. We told you that it was coming. He uses this word destined. We were destined for it. Affliction. I mean, think about someone coming to you and saying, hey, let's go follow Jesus. And let me tell you this, you are destined to suffer. Not the best sales pitch, but, but Paul, being somebody that emotionally was connected to these people, spiritually invested, he knew that they followed a crucified Christ. He did not want them to be unaware of what was to come. That in many ways, not many ways, in all the ways, I mean, Christianity at its core stands in complete opposition to the kingdom of this world. And Jesus died for it. And Paul says, hey, 
follow me, which if you know Paul's story, suffering, affliction, pain, shipwreck, beaten. He says, you will experience what I experience if you are a faithful Christian. And so one, he, he prepared them well for it. I think that's one just important, again, because as we think about what it means to receive God's word and have it work in you, we've got to know the reality. And sometimes we can, ourselves even, as we maybe witness or we love friends, that we can kind of wash this part and other parts of scripture away. But he says, no, you're supposed to suffer if you're a faithful Christian. And then the second thing is, is, is a little bit daunting. He says that in, in verse 18 himself personally that he was kept from coming to them because of Satan. And then in verse 5, he says, ultimately, I was afraid that the tempter was going to tempt you. Paul's really clear there that there was a real enemy. And this is the other aspect, that this wasn't a make-believe figure, but there was somebody that literally wanted to take them from faith in Jesus. They wanted to, to, to shake them in their affliction so that they would walk away. And again, I'm sure you might know people in your life, this might be something you personally have wrestled with, that as moments get hard, you really wonder, is God good? Is he present? Is he there? And really, I, I can't spend a ton of time on this part of just what you might call spiritual warfare or Satan and things like that. Again, I'll leave that to Charlie on some other sermon. He can unpack all of that. But, but he does make it really clear in what we see in the scriptures that what Satan does is he wants to put question marks where God has put periods. That where God has said things and promised things, he wants to begin to question those things. We see it from the very beginning to actually when Jesus comes, right? He says, did God really say this back in the garden with Adam and Eve? Did God really say that? Or as Jesus is tempted by Satan, he begins to ask him, are you the son of man? Like, if so, come on, kind of show it and prove it to me. And his tactic there is, again, to put question marks where God has put periods. And let me just say this, and this is where it connects to our community, that the enemy's lies take root best in the soil of Christians dis disconnected from community, separated from fellowship, and not regularly listening to the exposition of the word. And you know, there's two, there's two things I think that I, I want to give a responsibility for those of you that would say, this is my church home. I want to tell you this. One, you have a responsibility to be like a Timothy. Somebody's sent to be a strengthener and an encourager for those that you might know that are walking through tough and difficult times and seasons. The call is on us as followers of Jesus to be that for somebody. Not to have all the right answers, but to show up, to be present, to give a meal, to listen, to pray. That this is what God uses to strengthen people in the midst of affliction. He uses us. And the second thing, as I just kind of connected to that quote, is the, the other thing is Satan loves nothing more than to isolate. And this is where community is so important. Because if you do not have a belonging in a group of people, that what will happen as you begin to experience hardship or questions or things that are challenging is that you'll begin to isolate. No one else can understand what I'm going through. If I share this, this is a little bit too much. This might make things uncomfortable and awkward. And we've kind of kept things above board here. Like, I can't share that. And what that is, I mean, I, I, I do genuinely believe is that's that little voice beginning to say, hey, just keep that to yourself. Live with that or you know, maybe another time, and another time never comes, but there is this call where you've got to take a step towards being a part of community. You've got to take a step towards vulnerability. It is where God begins to strengthen our legs in the midst of affliction. And then as I move to our next point here, it's interesting to think that had Paul not been thwarted by Satan, as he says in verse 18, we actually would never have this letter. And in many ways, we might not have a lot of Paul's letters, that we now get to read and be encouraged and moved by it. And again, I think this speaks to the reality that God is sovereign even over the most difficult things in life. Even the opposition from the enemy, God is over that. He's using even that here as we see, as I mentioned, that Paul had to write this letter and pen this letter and it's changed hands thousands of times to where we get to have it today as God's very own word. And in the same way, over our affliction, we begin to learn because Jesus defeated the enemy of death. We begin to learn that even those hard times, God actually uses it for good in our life. And so Paul, like a concerned parent, as I mentioned, he says, I'm worried. And if you look here uh, in verse 6, he gets this report back finally. 
that he's been wondering, and it's not like today's world where, you know, there's technology and you can hear back so quickly, that he's having to wait a long time to hear about these people he really loves and cares about. He wonders if they're standing firm. In many ways, it would be like Timothy running through these doors and wondering if he's going to walk into an abandoned church. It's been empty. No one's here. They've all gone home. They said, it's not worth following Jesus. All this persecution and suffering is just not worth it. But what? Yet he walks back into, if you just look in verse 6, it says, but now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. That what Paul receives and hears from Timothy is that this community is stronger than it's ever been. That love abounds. And it really is like it should be a mind-blowing thing to think about. These people who are experiencing all sorts of difficult things that what in reality has happened is that it's grown them tighter and they love one another greater. And that this is a community now that is more alive than it has been. But if you see this first fourth point, but their faith is growing through love. I don't know if anybody has heard of uh, an author, Rebecca McLaughlin. She's written a few books, really, in the last few years. Great books. One on, uh, what's the Christianity book called? Confronting Christianity. It's a newer version of, you know, just kind of a defense of maybe some of the things that people take issue with intellectually or culturally with their faith. Confronting Christianity. It's a great book. She wrote a newer one as well called The Secular Creed, kind of unpacking some of the things that, you know, uh, main, big, big creeds of the secular world. She's a great writer, but she says this. My eight-year-old daughter, she says, is a great, uh, she's like great with vocabulary. She loves to read and she loves to write. But in one of her books, she says, but her writing is so dull, which I'm like, oh, that's kind of harsh to say as a parent. But she says her stories are so dull because all that is in them is like from happiness to happiness. That There's no suffering, there's no hardship, there's nothing in there that really produces this sort of uh, character development, right, where people bond and grow and are strengthened. And, and what you begin to see, as I mentioned, is that even in the hardest of things, what God is doing is he's bonding people together in a way that could never be possible without it. And so their faith is growing. I just think it's interesting, again, that, he, you know, the mark for, for Paul is not that, hey, this is a church that as I listened to them, that they had all their doctrine right. It was just really, really great theology. But what he is getting reported back is that they were faithful and that they love one another. That this was the mark. And those things, don't, don't get me wrong, those are not disconnected. Good doctrine leads to good practice and good love and a correct understanding of God. We don't disconnect the two. But you can have all that and miss the biggest thing. I'm sure many of us have had experiences maybe in sound doctrinal people, but there seems to be some love missing. But not this group of people. And again, uh, I, I think that's a hard, you know, we could spend a series on talking about how to love one another. But just, I think that this is one of the best things as we're going to move to this final point, is that we could pray towards. And we're going to see this in the last few verses here, but I just want to read this verse uh, we're doing a Bible reading plan as a church. I'd love to invite you into that. We've said we're going to continue to mention it. Whether you've jumped in with us or not, you can always roll into it. But uh, although we're about to start Leviticus, so actually, no, we're not, are we? Yeah, we are. You might not want to jump in yet. <laughs> Just kidding. When you have a community of people doing that with you, it's a good thing. Um, but it's a wonderful thing that we really are doing. And I didn't know that I did this, but I guess I signed up for receiving texts from the app. But I got this text this morning from a daily Bible verse that I thought was wonderful and it connected. And it, it says this from 1 John 3, 16. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. What a calling, right? But this, this group didn't pass that calling off. No, not me. I don't have this to give or this to offer. This group owned this verse that they were so gripped by God's death for them, his love for them in Jesus. And they knew that my call is now to love my brother and sister in that sort of way. And it's a high calling, but it's a beautiful calling. And finally, that high calling, I think, pushes us to this last and final point that we see in the text. If you look at verses 9 through 13, Paul essentially gets this report and then he just bursts into thanksgiving and prayer. He says in 9, For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you? For all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God. 
as we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and the Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. I think this is a wonderful place to end this morning because, Paul, I mean, think about your own life. That Maybe as you've prayed for something and longed for something and then you experience it, I think for many, as we experience maybe the answer to that prayer, that our prayer life actually begins maybe to suffer a little bit because we don't have that thing to pray towards anymore. And what Paul says here is, I've, I've been praying earnestly. And when he received the news, all he could do is continue to pray and give thanks to God. That this was a people that was so devoted and committed to prayer and to giving thanks to God that clearly this is so vital to this sort of church and this sort of community. Uh, one commentator says of this outburst of prayer and thanksgiving, he says, an outburst from Paul of the earnest conviction which was uppermost in the apostle's mind of the utter worthlessness of all human efforts without the divine aid. Paul believed that. Probably somebody that many Christians for centuries have looked up to, Paul. Paul knew that I got nothing to offer if I am not somebody that is fully devoted and committed and depending on God. And so let me, let me just say this, that, that us as a church, one of the ways that we get to regularly do this is in our community groups weekly as we gather to pray with one another we get to gather here in this setting and pray. And what we're going to start doing as well, if you were with us last week, we, we wrote some note cards of things we were thankful for in the first year of the life of our church. But as you walk in, and sadly it's not here this morning, I didn't have time to get to it. But as you walk in regularly on Sundays now, we're just going to have index cards in front of you like we do with the other things. And it's just a chance and a place for you to write a prayer. But as you walk into the space, and if there's something you're going through, and there's something you need prayer for, that that would be a place for you to write it. You don't have to put your name on it, but you could drop it in the back. Because we as a church, and Judy Becker is going to be so pumped about this announcement, we, we do pray every week as a church on Thursdays over Zoom. I know it's not ideal, but we do, from 12 to 12.30. And it is a chance for us to begin to believe and live into this more and more, that if we are not a church that is dependent on God in that sort of way, we will be a church that never accomplishes not only what we desire, but most importantly, what he desires. And so there's kind of a quick run-through of this community in this text, right? That this was a group that they were emotionally connected. They were spiritually invested. They stood firm in affliction. Their faith grew through love, and they were people devoted to prayer. And and what I wonder is if there's just one of those that might move you this morning or you might need to move towards. And again, as always, whether you hear that list and you feel like, man, I'm kind of doing some of these things good, or if you hear that list and you're like, I don't really add up to any of these. That, that what is so beautiful and what these people were ultimately rooted in was in the person and the work of Jesus. That like Paul, Jesus wasn't like orphaned. He really was orphaned from his father to come for a people that could never make their way back into the family. That Jesus went through affliction. He didn't experience it. He literally went to the depths of affliction, taking on the sin of the world so that we could experience God's free forgiveness and love for us in him and in him alone. And again, that is the root of where this love can grow, of where we can experience what it means to be that sort of community, always depending on him, because it is always him where we have any standing before God. And so as we move to the communion table this morning, this is a visual of that reality for us as a community, that we are a people that feast on the blood and the body of Jesus. It's not a community of people that have all worked out and figured out, but we are a community that want to believe what God says is true, and we want to begin to live into that as a community, knowing that it will make a difference. So we go to the source of where all of that comes this morning at the table, and so would you pray with me as we do? Father, we are thankful this morning again that we come and we gather in this space, not on our merit, not on how well things are going in our life currently, as we even just saw a snapshot from this text, God, that we could be going through really, really difficult and trying things. Things that we have actually played a really big part of in having them fall apart or things that maybe have just more so been happening to us seemingly randomly. 
But God, what we see in this text and what we see at this table and what we see at the cross is that you are not disconnected, that you are intimately involved in all of our lives. And the peace that makes sense of it all is the blood and the body of Jesus that for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that anybody who would believe in him would have life and life to the fullest. So Father, we long to be this sort of community as a church like the Thessalonians. Would you make that true for us? Empower us by the gospel and by your Holy Spirit. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he gathered with his